I think if there's any theme to this week's videos, it's going to be risk. I'm going to try to do two videos this week. They're both going to be a little on the risky side. And it's not like I'm going to jump off a cliff or anything. It's not like bungee jumping or skydiving type of risk. Today's video is going to be a tutorial. And if past experience on this channel is any indicator, tutorials don't usually do very well. And believe me, I'm not naive enough to think that I've got this great following. We're still building the channel. But if I get 500 views on one video, the tutorial videos usually get like three. So they're, you know, they're not super popular. But I want to do this one because last week I talked to Mark Sela on the phone for quite a while and he brought up this subject and it was a subject that I've wanted to do on this channel ever since I started it. And it kind of re-brought it up in my mind to think maybe I should, you know, take a chance, take that risk and make a video on equivalent exposures. Oh, overexposure. Now, one of the reasons I think doing a tutorial video is a little bit risky is because it's not easy to do. If I was sitting in a room with somebody explaining it, I could teach equivalent exposure. I could teach anything in photography, but doing it in a video is a little trickier because you're not there to explain a word that maybe didn't make sense to the person who's watching, or if you misspeak at all, if you say aperture when you really meant shutter speed, you can completely throw the whole thing off. So it's a little tricky and I've got to watch my words and I'm going to do my best to make this as clear as possible. But I want to do this because I think equivalent exposures is not something that I see being taught on YouTube. I mean, I'm not saying it's not out there somewhere, but most photography channels that kind of teach the basics of photography just kind of gloss right over this. And I think if you hang with me long enough, you're going to see that this is a pretty important thing. And if you understand this, you can build from there so much easier than if you don't understand this basic concept of photography. Okay, so let me start with a little bit of a basic concept so that we're all starting in the same place. When I take my camera out and I look through the viewfinder, press the shutter release button halfway down, I'm going to get in the in the viewfinder as well as on the LCD screen right here, I'm going to get the little meter scale. Now if I move my aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, a combination of those three, to where I get that little scale to line up, the little arrow to line up to zero, the camera is telling me that's a proper exposure. Okay, so that's kind of our main initial the meter telling us this is a proper exposure, whatever that happens to be under the lighting conditions that we are. Now, one of the best ways that I know to illustrate equivalent exposures is with glasses of water and filling them up. So let's go outside, I'll show you what I mean. One thing I wanna explain before I get into my water illustration is I wanna kinda of lay out what equivalent exposures are. The formula for an equivalent exposure goes like this, and I'll explain it as I go. E equals I times T. Now E stands for the exposure. Sorry if my table's wobbling. I stands for intensity. And T stands for time. Now the exposure is what we consider to be a good exposure. What our meter tells us is the proper exposure. Intensity is controlled by the f-stop or aperture. The t part of our equation is controlled by the shutter speed. Okay? So E equals I times T, exposure equals intensity times time, intensity controlled by our aperture or our f-stop, and time is controlled by the shutter speed. Okay guys, so here's my water in the glass illustration of equivalent exposures. Let's say that this glass full of water, completely full, represents the proper exposure. The controls that I have to make E exposure proper are intensity and time. Remember, I times T. 
So the intensity is how much water is going into the glass. The T part of it is how long it takes to fill it. So a small stream of water is the intensity, and here the time, however many seconds it's gonna take me to get to the top of this, and I stop. Full glass of water, that's my proper exposure. Now over here, if I pour much faster, I've got more intensity, but it'll take me less time. I get to the same spot, full glass of water or a proper exposure, but the intensity changed, so therefore the time changed. Now, when it comes to photography, everything is measured in stops. Now, when I say a stop, a full stop, you either double the amount of light or you cut the amount of light by half. So if I increase my intensity of my pour by doubling the amount, then my time should be cut in half. One more in intensity, one less in intensity, I get to the same spot. Now there is one other aspect. We've got aperture, shutter speed, but we also have ISO as a third element to creating this perfect exposure. Now ISO is our digital sensor's sensitivity to light. The higher the number with our ISO, the more sensitive it is to light, meaning it needs less exposure to get to the full glass of water. As far as my little illustration is concerned, if we change the ISO, we change the size of the glass. The more sensitive or the higher our ISO number is, the smaller the glass. We need less exposure to fill it up. So rather than this size, the higher ISO becomes a smaller container and it takes a lot less. The higher the ISO, the more sensitive our sensor is to light, the less exposure we need. Now I'm gonna take a photograph here in the backyard and show you some equivalent exposures of that same image. I'm not gonna get into all the ins and outs of why you would choose. I'll, I'll, we'll touch on it a little bit, but I think we could create five more videos if we get into all the aspects of why we choose what we choose. Um, but I think it'll make sense even more here in just a second. So here I have the camera set up uh, to take a photograph of this flower in my backyard. Shutter speed of 60th of a second, 5.6. And you notice the little arrow, the little indicator, is right on the zero saying that that's a good exposure. Okay, so that first image was a 60th of a second at f5.6. I'm at 100 ISO. So let's take the next one at a 30th of a second. From here to here, I added one stop of exposure. So over on this side, we're gonna subtract one stop of exposure, which will be F8. Okay, and then for a third shot, let's actually go, let's add two stops of exposure, which would be 1 15th to 1 8th of a second. And this time we're going to subtract two over here to compensate for the two we added over there. That would be F11 to F16. So we'll take a third shot at an eighth of a second at F16. And all of these should be equivalent exposures. All right, guys, so there are the three shots. I'm going to show them on the screen right here. And I haven't done anything in the computer or in Lightroom, Photoshop, anything opening up. They're straight out of the camera. First one was the 60th of a second at 5.6. Second one was a 30th of a second at F8. And the last one was 1 8th of a second at F16. And you'll notice that um, the depth of field starts to change. But the exposure, the overall exposure is the same throughout. So that leads us to 
another whole bag of worms is why would I choose one of those exposures over another one if I get the same result? Well, like I said, depth of field starts to change when we change our aperture. Shutter speed controls time, so the time element of our exposure is going to control motion. If we're photographing sports, we want to stop that motion. Or, you know, if we're showing a dancer eloquently dancing across the stage, maybe we want a little bit of blur. So we're going to create those effects based on the time or the depth of field with our aperture. And that's going to determine which one of these exposures we choose. But the point of this video is to show equivalent exposures. And if you understand those equivalent exposures, you can start making better educated decisions as to which one of those exposures you want to choose to achieve the effect that you want to achieve in your photographs. So I hope that helped. I hope I didn't lose you with the technical side of things and tutorials. Like I said, they're not always the most popular, but I hope it helped a little bit. If you've got comments or questions, please leave them in the comments section. Subscribe, like, share it, thumbs up. I would appreciate all of that stuff. I thank everybody who's subscribed already, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Have a great day, guys.